Growing up as an RPG appreciator in Europe wasn't great. Because of that, the PlayStation 1 library is something that I'm not as familiar with as I'd like to be. Even something as well known and often talked about as this game is something that I never really got to try out. Until now, so let's get this review for Brave Fencer Musashi going. Brave Fencer Musashi! Brave Fencer Musashi follows the adventures of Musashi, a brave fencer who was shield heroed to this isekai realm by a princess to help save the world. Then maybe the real Sun Musashi is this puny little thing. <sighs> the evil Thirst Quencher Empire has laid ruin to their castle and kidnapped a bunch of the villagers. So now it's up to Musashi to go out there and save the villagers, gather the magic scrolls, and collect a bunch of magical armor to save the day. Whether he wants to or not. Who did you say was puny? And why are you guys wearing such stupid costumes? Stupid costumes? Musashi isn't all that willing to do this, since he isn't all too invested in what's going on in this world, it not being his at all. But hanging around all these town folks who don't seem to care for him isn't really going to make the situation much better and he's not allowed to go back home until he's done the quest that they've asked him to do. So Musashi sets out to gather the scrolls and save the all-you-can-eat kingdom. Okay, so I need to get Lumina, right? That's right. Our world can have peace when we have Lumina and the five scrolls. Brave Fencer Musashi starts out feeling like a fairly typical action RPG. You've got a 3D camera that often prefers to keep an angled, often isometric view of the situation, all while you run around hacking away at the enemies with a regular combo. Oh, and charging up before swinging your sword lets you absorb enemies and lets you gain their powers as if you're Kirby, which is a pretty interesting ability to have. Sometime after starting, you get your second sword, Lumina, which instead of just being an upgrade over your regular sword, becomes your secondary weapon which you can use by pressing the secondary attack button, giving you a light and heavy attack on each button while framing it as an expansion on your original moveset, which is an interesting way to go about this. Charging up Lumina leads to all sorts of special effects based on the legendary scrolls that you've found. The scrolls aren't just MacGuffin items scattered around the lands, but actual upgrades that let you get further into the game. So far, it's all pretty simple, and explaining it is starting to get tiring, so let's take a break and rest up for a second. Oh, right, Brave Fencer Musashi has a fatigue system tied to an in-game clock. Time passes as you play, and day turns to night. There's an actual calendar system present too, with the current day on display in the corner of the screen at all time. If you spend enough time out adventuring and fighting enemies, Musashi starts getting tired, and once the fatigue meter is full enough, your movement starts growing sluggish. As in, you literally cannot run anymore. So every now and again, it pays to take a break and either rest out in the field or at an inn. Resting out in the open doesn't let you completely replenish your energy though. If you really want to go out exploring with no built-up fatigue, you need to hit up the inn in town or rest in your bed at home. Thankfully, the inn is always open at every hour, because that's not a thing for all the other shops in town. They all work with set opening and closing times. In fact, the entire town works with schedules like these, giving the game an interesting simulation feeling to it. If you're ever anywhere too early and are stuck waiting for the time to be right, sleeping is a good way to fast forward time too. It's pretty funny seeing the world move in fast forward, with villagers completely ignoring the sleeping kid in the middle of the street. What's especially impressive about Brave Fencer Musashi though, is that all the simulation stuff is going on in the background, and it's not even what makes the game stand out or interesting to play. It's just an extra thing that is there. It could have probably done this simulation content as early as it did, and sat on its laurels for being an impressive time waster simulator as it is. But Brave Fencer Musashi is a lot more ambitious than that. Who cares about that? No, the real strength of this game is just how absurdly varied the content is. One moment you're climbing a mountain and chopping down trees before going rafting down the waterfall, or you're trying to stop a zombie invasion by investigating the town to find the source of the issue, or you're closing steam valves with timed button press minigame sequences. 
It's kind of crazy to think how that's a series of timed button sequences, but you're doing it while a larger timer is ticking down the time limit between each individual valve, while a global timer is ticking down for the event, while the game is also still tracking time for the calendar system. If Wario Land 4's end of stage timers gave you anxiety, then this section's a complete nightmare. What a waste of time! See ya! While there's quite a lot of recycling going on in areas, as the world of Brave Fencer Musashi is pretty small, it's all just one little town and the area surrounding it, there's an especially good amount of variety and content, both in what you're doing, but also why. With tons of minigames, powers, abilities, and attacks to make use of. Y you You destroyed our future! Imbeciles, you think I care? Even early on in the game, you make your way to a giant head statue and destroy a bunch of statues surrounding it. Then you climb up a massive tower from the outside, avoiding the giant wheels rolling down, solve a simple puzzle inside the tower, then solve a simple positioning puzzle at the top of the tower, before getting chased on your way down by the giant rolling head statue as if you're playing a Crash Bandicoot stage. And then you have a battle against a giant robot in the middle of a town with tons of collateral damage. All that in the first half hour of the game, and you'd think that you'd seen it all after that, but no, even all the way to the very end of the game, Brave Fencer Musashi brings out new ideas and minigames for you to deal with. It's great. Along the way, you find pieces of Musashi's legendary armor. These don't raise your stats, but instead give you new abilities, like double jumping or wall climbing. The scrolls you're supposed to find give you various special elemental abilities, which lets you pass certain terrain types, like the water scroll lets you walk across water. And then you have the fusion ability, which lets you do things, sometimes. It's kind of underutilized, and that's a shame. There's some really fun abilities scattered through the game, but most enemies appear in only one area, often making them feel like they exist just to be a solution to an environmental puzzle, which is a shame because I would have loved to use certain abilities more often. But I guess it does help keep the adventure fresh, since it assures that you don't just end up playing the entire game with just the one ability that you like. Unfortunately, the gameplay is by no means perfect. It's kind of far from it. Combat might mostly be simple, but Musashi's reach with his regular sword is pitiful, and hit detection on enemies as well as stagger animation timings aren't the best, making his regular combo feel clumsy against a lot of enemies. At least there's no regular experience point system leading to a global level up with increased stat and health values here, so if you really don't want to fight most enemies, you don't really have to. That isn't to say that there isn't any leveling up that happens here, it's more of a romancing saga style level up system where performing certain actions increases the stats related to them. Combat feels especially awkward when fighting bosses, and that hurts the game especially bad. Because the build up and execution of most encounters against those are all great, but the fights tend to have some weird issue with signaling things in a clear way, so it often took me a while to get their patterns down. Not because the patterns are all that complex or difficult, but because there's some weird signaling going on where bosses will have their weak point in range for an attack, but you're not allowed to attack until the game wants you to. The fights that Musashi goes for is fairly common for games where you have to wait out an attack pattern by evading the boss before striking a weakness, though most games tend to visually appeal to these situations a lot better, using glowing body parts for the weak point or having exposed weak points come out at certain times. But Brave Fencer Musashi is not good at signaling things like these. One of the best examples of this is very late into the game, right near the end, where you fight one of the many leaders of a gang of thieves. He'll protect himself with magical barriers that you can't break. He won't properly expose himself until after firing a giant laser beam. But he also just teleports around the map without any protection, 
and you can't damage him during that even though the same fight's visual language basically tells you that he's open to attack when he does this. Fighting Musashi's rival, Kojiro, earlier into the game has a very similar issue. You can only attack him after he's done certain attacks. Despite the fact that he's wide open pretty much the entire fight long with very little stopping you from landing hits that don't do any damage, nor do they get punished. It feels very awkward. That said, doing what the game wants you to do when you've learned the proper patterns, these fights are actually pretty fun. It's just a case of very poor visual language on something that's mechanically not awful to play. Similarly, there's a lot of platforming sections where you often end up falling through the floor, but it's in this weird spot of consistency where you're always falling through the floor on a jump that looks correct the same way each time. So you can learn where the real landing spot is rather than the one you see and you'll be just fine. Brave Fencer Musashi is full of this kind of behavior. Things often don't work as you expect them to, or as you feel like the game is telling you it should. But it does consistently work this way. It was more of a pathetic journey than I thought. Dying stupidly and having to redo a few sections gave me enough extra time with them to notice that when you do know what you're supposed to be doing, the shortcomings don't feel like they matter that much. Basically, the game is very good on replays, which makes sense. There's a lot of variation in the content, and the way the game paces you through all these hugely different content types is superb. It's not as extreme, but it does remind me of early Platinum Games titles in some ways, where if you're properly blowing through it on repeated playthroughs, you're going to be in drastically different feeling over-the-top situations every few minutes, which helps keep it novel and entertaining every single time. The way Brave Fencer Musashi brings you to these different forms of content usually comes back to the central town. There's only one major town in the game, but it does get a lot of mileage out of it. With the mayor constantly running into one crisis after another that usually links back to the next major scroll or piece of legendary armor to help you explore the game further. If you forget what you were supposed to be doing, there's usually useful reminders on the pause menu. Usually. The text there ranges from telling you exactly where to go and what to do to, I don't know, just mess around and stumble onto the next plot point, I guess. What's especially cool about the town, though, is that it also makes good use of the game's timer system. The villagers all have their daily routine, and shops open and close at certain times. It gives a lived-in feeling to the town, even though there isn't really all that much to it. There's even a grocery store selling food items that expire after a certain amount of days. Or on the opposite end of the scale, there's cheese that heals more points the longer it's been in your inventory. It's all really inventive and interesting. After covering so much Etrian Odyssey lately, it's nice to play a game where the developers felt inspired enough to mess around with that calendar system that they put in place. The town also gives you access to the castle, which is your real home base. Unfortunately, most of the people residing in the castle have been taken prisoner by the Thirst Quencher Empire, having been trapped into these big green gems scattered around the game world. Slashing at those with Lumina frees them from their prison and sends them back to the castle while also giving you some extra max BP to use for your fusion abilities. A lot of the villagers also unlock some extra things after speaking to them at the castle, like teaching you new combos to use in combat or unlocking new food in the store. Unfortunately, the castle area is only accessed through a menu, so you don't get to walk around the area as it's being repopulated. I don't think being able to walk around a castle is too much to ask for, considering Suikoden managed to do something like this on the PlayStation 1 and Soul Blazer got away with it on the Super Nintendo. But at the same time, with how many different directions this game was likely developed into at the same time, expanding one section of the game likely would have meant we'd have lost something in return, especially with how Square developed games in those days, or in a game that covers this much ground in all directions at once in general. So I can't complain too much about something superfluous like town expansion being more properly visualized being missing, even if it's one of my favorite things in video games when done right. Because the way that the game ties saving the villagers into progression in so many ways at once is definitely impressive. It expands your moveset, it unlocks more items, it gives you more BP to use for your abilities, and it makes you feel like you saved someone, all from a single reward type for exploration. It's extremely elegant game design. 
Saving villagers and the things they unlock isn't the only way you're rewarded for exploring the world either. There's also a bunch of stray bunnies hopping around at night. During the day you see their droppings on the field, and if you come back to that point at night, you get a max health upgrade for catching them. They say Shigeru Miyamoto got the idea to design Mario 64's 3D control scheme by trying to catch one of these rabbits for several hours, saying he wanted to make a game where the act of doing this was actually fun. What is actually fun though, is the tone of the game. If only our fortune teller Sia Beaverly were here, she would know. She ran off with some handsome dude, huh? No, she was kidnapped. What? So the princess is not the only one? Well, actually, there were 40 people at All You Can Eat Palace. Now there are only five left. As you can probably already tell from clips scattered through the video, from what I can tell, it's mostly the same in Japanese, although the Thirst Quencher Empire and their soda-based name theming is alcohol-based in Japanese. A similar toning down happens when you enter the so-called restaurant and see all the soda pop bottles. It's obvious what is really going on. An empty soda pop bottle. And the lines put so much emphasis on calling it the wrong thing that it feels like it's intentionally making light of the changes on its own. So, do I recommend Brave Fencer Musashi? Yeah, it's a good time. It's one of those games where a lot of the individual pieces might not be the best, but they fit together very nicely to make a great experience, and I'm glad to have finally played it. If you haven't played it before, it holds up very well, even if you have no nostalgia for it, so yeah, I highly recommend it. Speaking of games where there's a lot of individual parts coming together, I asked people on Patreon an important question. What makes a great game? Is it a game doing one thing very well, or is it a game being a sum of its parts? A game being a sum of its parts won very easily, actually. I thought this one would be a bit closer, because personally I'm on the does one thing well side of things. Most of the games that I end up replaying a lot over time are the games that do one thing extremely well, which is why I like roguelikes, roguelites, and arcade games. Nothing against games that are the sum of their parts, like I like Deus Ex a lot as well. And not one single aspect of Deus Ex on its own is particularly great, at least in my opinion. It's how it all comes together. But personally, I'd rather replay Sunset Riders or Beautiful Joe. Sorry for the long wait between videos, I actually wanted to make a video on a different game instead, but that one just didn't pan out at all. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, maybe subscribe. And as always, this video was brought to you by the people supporting the channel on Patreon as well as channel members. If you want to become one of the names that you see scrolling on the screen right now and maybe catch videos early, head over to patreon.com slash above up or become a member and I will uh, see ya.